Well, first of all, it was my great privilege to work with General Wallace. In my role in the opening stages of OIF was, I was the J-5 at the land component, 3rd Army, and General Wallace uh, was fated to execute the plan that I helped write. Uh, what we bring is uh, validation, if you will, of the old uh, saw from Moltke the Elder that no plan can look with certainty beyond initial contact with the enemy main body. Uh, we hit upon, and this is something the general and I spoke about, uh, the decision that he took, which was truly a core command level decision, on how to deliver the entire three brigades of the 3rd Division to Baghdad, which was the operational center of gravity, so-called, in our major campaign plan, COBRA II, while ensuring that his lines of communication were protected. So he had to reorganize the entire core effort with the 3rd Division, the 101st, the 82nd as a controlling division headquarters, and all of the other associated troops that were still coming into theater. Uh, this is a, a, a massive decision. Uh, and the, the way he covered it in the, in, the, in the book, I think is very important because tactics uh, is how a core fights. It is just tactics at a very uh, higher level of command. He was setting divisions up to fight and moving brigades around to ensure that division commanders had what they needed to fight. And I think that'll be, I hope it will be, uh, as fascinating to the reader as it was to me to be an observer and then to assist in writing this with General Wallace. Wonderful. I maintain that uh, this book will be useful, more than useful, it will be uh, vital to making the transition from company grade to field grade, from a company grade officer to truly understanding what it means to be a general staff officer, working for a general, thinking about the linkage of tactical success to attaining policy objectives, which is the whole purpose of the, the military art and science. Uh, the effective use of military force uh, that is done at division and corps and field army level. That's how vital I think this is going to be. And uh, having seen it myself, it being uh, the transition uh, of the majors, uh, the captains, and even some lieutenant colonels that we have coming through Command and General Staff College, and then in my, as in when I was privileged to be the director of SAMS, that further transformation of coming to grips with how do I put my personal tactical level experience, which is by and large platoon and company level, uh, into the totality of the picture of a division operation, of a division as a part of a core. And what are those linkages required? What, what does it take to set up a higher order tactical decision to sequence and sustain battle not individual fire and movement, but envisioning where battle's going to take place. What do I need at that moment in time? As Clausewitz talks about, the, the soldier with the right equipment in the right order, at the right place, at the right time to win a particular battle or engagement. And then to look beyond where is the next engagement where do I want it to take place? And if it takes place somewhere else, I do not anticipate. How do I sustain the fighting elements? Which is exactly what General Wallace had to do. During the fight, we didn't really have an operational pause. You know, thankfully, Mother Nature uh, sent us uh, the great Shamals. Uh, and there might have been, I think, what we could call a tactical pause, although we were forbidden to use that term. Uh, no, there's no pause. We've, it's the fight is ongoing. Uh, and this is, again, the reality of fighting 
because war is an extension of policy through other means. And so policy makers have a role. And in the modern age in which we live now, with all of the devices and all of that, uh, you know, the old clip about the thousand mile screwdriver, uh, you know, what, what can be controlled from Washington will be controlled from Washington, which is another part of making the transition to a general staff officer, field grade officer from a company. So the operational pause, which wasn't the tactical pause, uh, it was necessary, again, thinking in terms of sequencing and sustaining battle. Baghdad was the operational center of gravity in the major operations plan. We had to deliver forces to Baghdad to isolate the regime there, isolate the means of enemy control from the rest of the country. At that same time, you know, General Wallace became somewhat famous for being quite honest and saying that the enemy we're fighting is not the enemy we war game against, which is absolutely true because I ran those war games. We did not envision the bug hunt that took place, and if I can make that allusion to uh, Starship Troopers. Uh, the Fedayeen coming up and, you know, in pickup trucks with 14-7 you know, machine guns and, and running around in, in AKs and all of that. Uh, but that was necessary to control the lines of communication. So General Wallace had to take advantage of the time that we had to introduce the 101st, to introduce the 82nd Division, and give them changes of mission or redirection in order to deliver the 3rd Infantry Division in toto to Baghdad. And so that's why that became necessary. And again, a terrific example of even call it reframing, if you will, if you're thinking of that in terms of design, for example. But it was a redirection of tactical decision making at the highest order, where the core commander and his supporting staff had to see the totality of that tactical fight from the depth and the breadth of the core zone. And so this was necessary time, call it what you will, call it a turnip. Uh, but it was time that General Wallace needed to reorganize the forces that he had, envisioning the fight that he knew he must make at Baghdad. And by sustaining it, meaning how do I deliver the third division in the best form I can while protecting my lines of communication, which extended at that point all the way from Kuwait up to the forward uh, line of battle. Uh, so, you know, this really did happen. Now, it also affected our, our, our Marine brothers and sisters on the right flank. Again, my role as the J-5, looking at this across the entire C-Flick zone, uh, the Marines were affected as, as well, and they were facing this same thing. How do they deliver the 1st Marine Division or as many regiments of the 1st Marine Division as they could while protecting their own LOCs. Uh, so General Conway was faced with much the same kind of decision. But General Wallace's uh, discussion of this, uh, I think really was this was the central part of the tactical fight from that higher order uh, from the time we took, we crossed the line of departure. Well, I, I was very fortunate to have a very small uh, <clears throat> detachment of, of Army military historians. Uh, and, and it's, you know, our chief of staff at the Third Army, Seaflick, was a, a great Marine general, General Blackman. And he had no idea where to put these folks. So he just said, Kevin, you got them. Take care of them. Uh, and it was wonderful. Uh, because these folks, and, and now, of course, can I remember one name? No, I can't. I apologize. Uh, I mean, there's, no, there's an unsung hero, darn it. Uh, they were collecting all of the, the screenshots from Blue Force Tracker and, and overlays and such as they were, because we didn't make any uh, 
you know, the old-fashioned grease pencil acetate overlays. It was all electronic, but they were capturing all of those, and they put together this marvelous, uh, I don't even remember how many megabytes of data this was. Uh, and, and, and I hasten to add, it was all properly declassified. Uh, no, I, I mean, really, I made sure of that, uh, that uh, I was able to use. And so when uh, you all approached me to be a part of this, which was, again, what a privilege, uh, I was looking for what I had to be able to give a picture of snapshots in time associated with the tactical decisions that General Wallace, as Corps Commander, was going to make. And I, I just was fortunate. I remembered that, wait, I, I remember seeing something like this, and so I dug back into my, my personal files, and I found these, the screen, these, they were screenshots that were turned into PowerPoint for the purpose of making this historical record. And, and thankfully, and your own artists did a marvelous job in, in making them, them readable. And, and so, but that's where they came from. They were actual shots at the time of where individual units were, which is what I thought was, would be very powerful to highlight what was going on when. The the truth of the way we grow up as officers is that most salient, that most vivid experience becomes our base for the rest of our careers. And, and therefore, when one is so lucky to become a battalion commander, to become a brigade commander, that's the first time you've ever done that job. Much the same is true with being a division commander and a corps commander, I would, I would assume, and I, I think more than an assumption, I think it's reality. What prepares General Scott Wallace to become a corps commander and take a corps into battle? Well, the only experience that we have is the vicarious experience of history. Uh, and as we were talking earlier, you know, the captains and the majors now in staff college have to find a way to put their small unit experience into the larger whole. Where did my company fit in the division, in the core? How, does, how, does, how do I make sense of that? You know, never forgetting that you know, I was cold and wet and hungry and the, and the ammo was late and the, and the class three showed up just as we were crossing the LD. So I have to bear that in mind, but now I'm a division staff officer, I'm a core staff officer. I'm not going to cross the line of departure in a combat vehicle. Some of the guys in five corps never crossed the line of departure because the main didn't move. So this vicarious experience through history of the participant himself, uh, I, a, a reader with some who can discern these lessons will find it very valuable. And even if you're, you know, the, the most you'll ever be is a lieutenant colonel, we all realize that you know, there's a point in time where we're not going to be leading troops anymore, but we're going to be staff officers. And what does it take to be a good staff officer? And it's not the nine to five grind. It's recognizing where I am and how does my organization ensure that the individual soldier, the squad, the platoon, the company's tactical level success is not squandered. It is linked to something higher. Again, the vicarious experience of history that we will have uh, in this book, from this book, I believe. First of all, I would look to the Combat Studies Institute. 
the two marvelous uh, on point that were that were published right here at f from Fort Leavenworth in the Combat Studies Institute. That's wonderful stuff. And I've read both of them. It's wonderful. Uh, and I, I'm a great believer, of course, go figure, I, all that money to get a degree in history. Uh, but I'm a great believer in being able to experience what other decision makers faced remembering the context of the time in which they did it. So, uh, I, you know, on point series, absolutely number one. But uh, you know, any, good, any good history, uh, in particular, one of my f favorites, uh, Command Decisions by Lucian Truscott, uh, who was a, an assistant division commander, a division commander, a corps commander, an army commander, in World War II, uh, who'd never been to war before. The first time he went into battle, he was a brigadier general. Yeah, and, and so how did he prepare for that? Well, he prepared by, by reading history, by coming to staff college, uh, and then learning, continually learning. You know, he's the He's the man who said time spent in reconnaissance is never wasted. Well, he put that into practice. He was a cavalryman, yet he became famous for leading an infantry division, the 3rd Infantry Division. Oh, how about that? 3rd Infantry Division. Look at that link. So those are the things that I, I, I would do. I would look for you know, those great uh, Field Marshal Slim's book, uh, Victory from Defeat. Uh, again, a great book about what it took to sequence and sustain battle, visualize where battle would take place, what higher level decision making was all about. I mean, there, I mean, there are so many. General Wallace was great about doing that. Uh, you know, you know, and, and just the word simple, because uh, I, I, I can't help myself, I always go back to Clausewitz, you know, where he said that in war everything is simple, but the simplest things are the most difficult. So the Corps commander ensuring that the soldier is in the right place at the right time with the right equipment and set up to win. And just all of those, I'm sorry, none of them, you asked me that question, I should have anticipated it, but I didn't. I apologize. I, you know, there, there are so many wonderful things. Like I said, it was, it was so wonderful working with General Wallace on this because you know, here's a man who studied the art and science of war uh, and, and had that moment where you know, he went to war as a junior officer in Vietnam and then as a corps commander, leading a corps in battle, taking amazing decisions. You know, there's a man from whom we should learn. There's a passage in the first on point where during the, this fight that we talk about, that, that core level decision of reorienting, you know, third division, 101st, 82nd, uh, Fontenot and the other authors of On Point uh, relay something that happened where this is personal leadership at its finest. You know, given all of the, the, the ability to have situational understanding from Blue Force Tracker, from reports, from, from all this, but the feel of personal leadership. Uh, the story, as best I recall it in On Point, is General Wallace and General Petraeus are on the hood of a Hummer looking at a map and the personal security detachments are around and a fight develops and Wallace goes to the fight to see the fight not to interfere but to see now here's a three-star general going to the sound of the guns uh, he has no, and he knew 
He wasn't going to interfere in the tactical fight. I mean, it's a squad leader, a platoon leader taking care of that. But to be seen at the point of action with the division commander, I might add. Uh, in World War II, Patton got a Distinguished Service Cross for doing that in the beachhead at Gala. Just going to the fight, lending his person to the fight. Uh, this was just another day in the desert for General Wallace. So the, the combination of personal leadership, now aided, of course, by all of the marvelous technical means. You know, that's science supporting the art of war and the art of personal leadership. Now that's, and it's not in this book because General Wallace, he wasn't gonna talk about himself. He was gonna talk about the decision making, but you know, to expand it, to look at the man, you can look in on point. The, uh, on point one. That, that's the one thing that leaps out. Is there anything that you've left out? Anything else you think we ought to talk about? No, no just that you know, I think this book is timely given the point where we are, where we're coming out of a long war. And you know, right now, we have Corps and Division headquarters committed to a fight that they are directing in Iraq against Daesh and, and really not maneuvering troops, but they are linking the tactical actions to attainment of policy objectives. So it's timely. It's, what does it take for that general staff officer to do that? What do these general officers have to do to consider politics, policy, American politics and policy, Iraqi, Iranian, coalition, all of those coming together because war is still an extension of policy through other means.